uh, ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? Now I would like to introduce uh, our next speaker. It's going to be Marvin Liu. And uh, Marvin will talk about uh, from startup to scale up best practices in growth from Silicon Valley. Valley. And uh, you have my presentation, right? Uh, I hope so. I, hope so. <laughs> I, I give <laughs> okay. it to somebody. And uh, yeah, there it is. Marvin is a partner of uh, 500 startups company from US. All right, thank great. you very much, and I pass my voice All right, to Marvin. Thank you. So, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, it is good. I, sh I can want my standing on the stage, just like. Great. Oh yes, thank you, sir. All right. All right. Great. Um, I know I'm the last speaker, so I will. Tr I think my talk will probably be about 20 to 25 minutes, and then I have another about 10 to 15 minutes, I think, for questions. Uh, so I know I'm supposed to be. This is a VC investment one. They they moved me from like the the startup advice one. So if this sounds like a little bit more startup advicey, that's the reason for it. Um, and if you have questions about VC stuff, of course we're VC firms, so happy to chat about this. All right. Uh, so first, who am I? Um, this is like your credibility slide. So who, who is this guy? Why is he qualified to talk about the subject, right? So uh, I'm a partner of 500 startups. Um, I run the San Francisco office, and I also run the San Francisco-based accelerator there. Um, I mentor at about 20 different startup accelerators. I actually, probably more than that, and I just kind of lost track. Uh, I sit on the board and advise you board of several, um, I would say like early and mid-stage um, startup companies, mainly in the ad tech as well as digital media space. Um, and I also spent about 10 and a half years at um, Yahoo as an executive. So I spent a lot of time actually in this region. Uh, before this, I was actually at um, an e-commerce um, startup that raised about $45 million actually, and also proceeded to spend $45 million. This is during 99 and 2000, right? So learn a lot of sort of on the way up and on the way down. So I um, have sort of fairly broad Silicon Valley experience. So I've been in Silicon Valley now for about almost 15 years. Uh, so who's five, who here has heard of Five and Startups? Please tell me you guys have heard of Five and Startups. Somebody, some people have heard of it. Okay, good. Um, for those who have not <laughs> heard of Five and Startups, uh, we're, we're a five-year-old um, seed fund. So we have probably about $120 million under management. We are an accelerator as well as a seed fund. So we invest in early stage companies and I'll, I can talk a little bit more about that. Um, and so, you know, the reason a fund like mine actually exists now, um, so we have about, 12 partners in the fund right now, like um, 12 partners who actually are investors. Um, the reason that we, that, that's the startup world's changed a lot, right? You know, as I mentioned to you, um, you know, in 99, 2000, we raised about $45 million. And actually a big chunk of that, 40, you know, like 20, $25 million of that was actually to go buy servers, right? And so there's been all these changes, Amazon Web Services, cloud services, PayPal, Apple App Store, you know, all these great platforms like Google AdWords and Facebook completely has changed the game. So before it used to raise even five million, ten million dollars just to build a prototype, now it's probably fifty to a hundred thousand dollars to build a prototype. The cost of actually doing startups has gone down dramatically over the last ten years. And so a fund like mine, the seed the seed fund that I work at, it wouldn't even exist ten years ago. Did wouldn't have done well because we we invest typically between Fifty to about hundred thousand dollars, in some cases up to two hundred fifty thousand dollars checks. These are that's very very small, but that's actually enough to sort of get companies to sort of early traction. Um, and so basically, there's been a lot of change in startup. Overall, the cost of, of doing startups has actually shrunk um, dramatically. I think in some cases like ten estimates, in some cases have been a hundred times um, cheaper to actually do startups. So we're very very lucky to be here this day and age. But at the same time just because it's easier and cheaper to do startups, it's still hard, right? Because there's just a lot more competition. You know, they say there's something close to, there's about, in Silicon Valley alone, there's probably something like about five to 10,000 startups that actually, you know, actually get VC funding or some type of seed funding, right? If you think about that, and if you think about the total number of startups globally, probably less than 1% of companies globally get VC funding, right? So think about the percentage of, of actual investments. So startups at, at, at the end of the day are still very, very hard. Uh, and it's a great book, by the way. And, and so, you know, assuming, you know, that this is a Katerina Fake, I actually worked with her at Yahoo. Uh, she said this thing called, working on the right problem is more important than working hard. And it's actually really true, of finding the right market and actually making sure that you're actually focusing on the right things. And I'll, I'll dig into that a little bit more. So let me ask you a question. Who here are startup people? Who here has their own startups? What, what, do you, what, is, what do you think is the most important thing for startup success? Is it anybody, huh? Well, let me, let me talk about it this way. 
do you think the most important thing to start success is actually having a good product? What's, what's, what do you think is the biggest factor? It's a general question. Solving a general problem? Maybe. Any other tries? Small room. Yeah, yeah, Easier said than done, right? And what, what, what does that actually mean? But I'll, I'll, I'll cover that. So, so you know, the good thing is this, uh, there's actually real methodology right now in early stage. Everyone knows Lean Startup, right? Everyone knows Lean Startup, Eric Ries and Steve Blank, the customer development process. Everybody knows and heard about it, but nobody really practices it. But the idea is that there are awesome, awesome new methodologies now to sort of test your hypothesis and to do things very, very cheaply, right? That's been one of the benefits actually of, of sort of the new sort of startup ecosystem now. There's lots and lots of knowledge, a lot of blogs, a lot of books, and a lot of expertise now. So that's actually one of the great things now. And ultimately, assuming you do the right thing, you're making stuff that people want from Paul Graham of, of Y Combinator, right? But having said that, it's like, assuming you're actually working on the same thing, having, you know, doing, making stuff that people want, the most important thing, the best companies from the beginning have a very, very clear vision in mind, right? And so, you know, I remember Facebook back in the day, it was all about, even from the beginning, it was about connecting people, right? If you think about sort of taking these offline sort of activities and taking it online. If you think about what Google did straight from the beginning of like 98, 99, it was all about organizing the world's information. So having a really, you know, I'm very, very lucky to be sort of where I am because we have a very big sample size of companies, right? I worked at Yahoo, you know, had spent a lot of time with the folks at Google, of just like the best companies from the beginning, Airbnb, the guys at Airbnb, is just like from the beginning, they had a very, very clear view and vision of actually what they wanted to accomplish from the beginning. And I think that's what actually what differentiates a really, really good startup versus a not so great startup. And the other thing, once you actually figure out what this vision is, is this thing called language to market fit. And so it's like, how does a user describe what your product does and what your startup does? And so the example I use, for example, is um, dating sites, right? There's a big difference of finding a date versus helping your friend find a date, right? Or there's a big difference of actually hotel booking sites versus like hosting when you're an Airbnb of how does a customer actually describe your product and the use of your product. And this language and market fit is actually really, really important. And this is not something I created, it's something created by a guy named James Courier, who's probably one of the best thinkers. Um, he runs a, a company called Uga Labs, and he's worked with, you know, he was a guy who sold Monster, you know, he worked at Monster, worked at a whole bunch of really, at Tickle, worked at some very, very big high growth companies. Um, the other thing too is that ultimately, you know, in the beginning, and you remember my friend Mark talking about in the beginning, doing small things that actually don't scale, right? Like a lot of times you go and talk to these VCs and they're like, oh, well, this, this market might not be big enough. The reality is that you have to start with very, very small segments in the beginning to see if stuff is actually working first before you go and take it out further, all right? And that's actually one of the benefits of all these platforms, which I'll talk about afterwards, that allow you to do these micro segmentations, right? And so, you know, I, there's this question. I, I had a leading question, and this is from my boss. He says, you know, I'm appalled at a number of stars to say we spent nothing on marketing. Our customer acquisition is entirely organic, AKA I'm a marketing retard. In our opinion, and this is actually 500 Startups thesis, is that having a great product is actually expected now, all right? All users expect a good user experience, right? If you think about when you l launched an app five years ago, there were probably several thousand apps on the Apple App Store. There's 1.5 million apps on the Apple App Store now. And so to stand out, doesn't matter if you have a good product or a great product, you will get lost in the shuffle. So the big differentiating piece, besides having a good product, is actually making sure people know who you are, know where to find you. And so this is actually where sales and marketing is really, really important. And this is actually something I spent a lot of time in this region. It's a big problem in Asia, it's a big problem in Europe, it's a big problem in Canada, where there's too much focus just on the product, right? That we all assume the product works. All right, as a user, as an investor, I assume your product works. The big thing I think about is what is your customer acquisition strategy? And so the big part is that making sure, I mentioned this earlier, is understanding, you guys will have the slide, these slides afterwards, is really understanding the stage that your startup is. Because I think the danger, you know, I mentioned the great thing about being in the startup world right now, you have all these amazing resources that you can actually, there's blogs, there's all these guys talking about how they've gathered customers and done these different things. And that's awesome. But the thing is that I think if you're going and learning from like Airbnb or Dropbox or like PayPal or whatever, all these other awesome, awesome companies, like it makes more sense to 
go and understand what did they do the first year that they were actually in business? How did they grow the first year? Not what they did in year five, right? Because your tactics are going to be determined by your scale and your audience space. And so if you're an early stage startup, look at what other early stage startups are doing to grow, right? Or if you're looking at very, very big successful companies, take a look at what they did like three, four years ago before they became very, very big. Does that make sense? And so be really careful. Have a good filter for advice that you're getting. Have good filter for stuff that you're reading. Because a lot of times you're reading these, and there's tons of awesome startup books now. It's like, oh, we did this thing to grow, right? Dropbox uses great video, and they did this like sort of viral marketing thing. It's like, well, that might have worked very, very well for them because of the stage that they're in, because of their product line. How is that relevant for you? And you need to have that filter, all right? And also think about the stages. Um, and the other part that's also, I actually think the big reason why, if you take a look at the growth of the best companies that have actually grown in Silicon Valley, Dropbox, Airbnb, PayPal, um, you know, the list goes on. Um, the, the difference is that a lot of them start off not just marketing and mark, you know, there's this term called growth, right? Has anyone heard of growth hacking, right? I hate that term, but it's just like, it is a useful term of differentiating versus marketing. And the way you think about marketing, which is actually still important, in the beginning, it's actually about growth hackers, about finding your users, right? And that's actually really depend on distribution channels. The other part is actually how you scale that going further is actually buying them. And that's where marketing is actually important. So in the beginning, growth, Growth hacking is really, really important for early stage companies. As your company gets bigger, marketing becomes more important, right? Because that's, that's the only way you can actually control and build your business systematically is by advertising, right? Because you control the spend and once you figure out your unit economics, you actually can grow and know if I put in a dollar, I know it can get $2 out. That's actually how you grow sustainably and that's why you raise VC money later on. And so if you guys want to read books on this stuff, my friend Sean Ellis wrote an awesome book called Lean Startup Marketing. He's the guy who actually coined growth hacking. Awesome, awesome book. Ryan Holiday is also another book. So I, I, I give lots of book, um, really, really good book recommendations and you can download them all on Kindle. So awesome books. Um, and the other thing, this is, this is a metrics that we think a lot about. This is um, created by my, my boss, Dave McClure at 500 Startups, is about using the R metrics. Acquisition, activation, retention, revenue, referral. And this is a framework I look at all businesses, right? This is a framework I look at the, when you bring a customer from the beginning, what happens? I think too many times in the beginning, there's just this big, big focus on the acquisition piece of the funnel. And I actually think, and I would argue the hardest piece of this is the activation retention. I worked with a startup, it took us nine months to go and figure out the, you know, they, they end up getting, I think, like 10 million downloads, but the actual sort of retention level was very, very low. And that was actually one of the things we spent Almost close, yeah, almost close to like nine months digging into the customer base, digging into the, checking the conversion funnels and trying to figure out where people dropped out, who the customer bases were, all these things just to go and how we actually wrote, you know, sort of drove out the acquisition rates and the activation and the retention rates. And so if you take a look at this, right, something in the, you know, one of the great things now, there's all these awesome channels you can actually get a lot of users, but getting the users one thing, but the thing is, if you spend money, get users, and they're actually not falling through and not downloading your app or not using your product, that's wasted money. And so this is actually a great framework to go and figure out where people dropping out. Um, and so this is actually, I look at, I, I go and, and meet companies, you know, both to help them, you know, whether our portfolio companies or to evaluate companies, this is actually a big piece that we look at. It's like, let's take a look at what your conversion funnel looks like. Let's take a look at actually what's happening with your art metrics and where we think the biggest problems are and where we can actually help. Um, and the reality is that growth is a process. Um, you know, it's, it's really, I think that growth is a scientific process, right? It's basically, you have a hypothesis and you run a bunch of tests, right? It's, you know, are my audience is gonna be here? Are they gonna respond to this messaging? Are they gonna do this better? This is actually, so you, when you go through this process of generating ideas, then you organize your priorities, you're testing them on different channels or messaging, you do analytics and then actually optimizing this and then sort of repeating it over and over again. All the best companies, right? You know, and this is a great story I, I heard from Chama Palapani. He's actually Actually was the first growth guy at Facebook is that you remember in the early days and I think it must have been in 2007 2008 I remember he was telling the story about the fact that they spent so much time actually bringing in a lot of users there you know to their site but what was happening is that they were not all these users were actually dropping out and so so Chalmers when I said you know let's let's stop acquiring new users and let's go and spend like literally spent a year focusing on how we actually can retain users when we bring them in that they're going to actually bring in more friends right and that's actually how, how Facebook grew violently so they spent a lot of time on thinking through the conversion funnel and actually building in a growth process of testing everything 
and they took a year. But once they kind of figured out this funnel, they were able to go out and bring more users in, right? Does that make sense so far, right? If you figure out activation, figure out retention, that is actually probably the most important thing that you can actually do before you actually go and acquire new users, right? That's, and that's actually contrary to a lot of stuff that you read and you see. And here's sort of this sort of the results, right? It's that growth is not this sort of overall curve, it's spiky. And, and the reality is that a lot of the tests that you run with this process, nine out of 10 of the tests that you run are actually gonna be inconclusive. But that's actually okay, because you're learning through every single test, even a failed test, you're learning new things. And the best companies over time, even if you've learned those small things over time, you know, think about how, if you run, you know, I would say, Facebook runs something close to like, they run like five to 10, like these, you know, I think it's probably more now, but back in the day, they're doing five to 10 tests like a month, right? And think about the knowledge that they're acquiring by running this, you know, this methodology over and over and over again, the incredible knowledge you're getting about your user base, about your audience, about your messaging, about your product, it's, it becomes a massive competitive advantage over any of the startups that you actually, your competitors, right? If you think about that. And so this is why this is actually really hard. A lot of people go and say like, oh, I ran these like four tests, I didn't learn anything, so I just stopped doing it. I'm like, you're an idiot. Like, this is actually a systematic process you have to do over and over and over again. This is why it's hard. This is why most companies actually do not do this. Right? And this, let's go to distribution marketing, right? So we talked about this. We are so lucky now. You know, you know we raised $45 million back in 99, 2000. Half of it was to, to, cloud, you know, to services, like buying ad servers and hardware and stuff. And the other part was actually spending money on advertising because we do not have all these channels. How lucky are we now? Well, we have things like the Apple App Store or things like I mentioned, Facebook reaches over 1.4 billion people. It's probably, that number is probably bigger now. That you can reach so many people really cost effectively or things like Google AdWords or even now where I'm very excited about like, you know, do you have platforms like WeChat, platforms like, um, you know, these messaging, mobile messaging apps like KakaoTalk or, um, you know, or, you know, there's just lots and lots of these, right? Uh, WhatsApp. These, you know, all these reach like several hundred million users a month. So there's tons and tons of channels. You can reach a lot of people. But here's the challenge of this, is that channels change. This is actually, I stole this slide from my friend James Courier, and it's from Ooga Labs. If you take a look at the growth of these channels, right? And so the example I use is like Zynga, right? Zynga grew completely on the back of Facebook, of Facebook social, of, of basically the social streams. But the problem is that when, when Facebook basically changed the algorithm, it just went down. And so that was, I, I think that's a big, big part of it is if you look at sort of most of these growth channels, you're gonna get probably most of your growth from at least 80% of your growth from one channel. And so this is, this is a challenge, right? Or just when you're riding these channels, you're growing very, very quickly, what happens when that channel actually goes, you know, changes? And so this is actually really interesting. Um, and so this book is just from my colleague, um, Justin Mears, it's called Traction. And it talks about like all the different, there's like 19 sort of customer acquisition tr um, channels that he recommends in here and how to think about them. And, and the great, um, the, the, let's see this. and this is a framework that he uses to think about this, right? Where we think about, but, and this is methodology we, t we took from companies, Coca-Cola. So co when Coca-Cola first started like doing, you know, sort of, all looking at all these different market channels, they use a 70-20-10 methodology. 70% of your money and time, you spend on the stuff that works, that you know that works for sure. 20% on sort of more of like new sort of exploratory sort of channels, and then 10% of your time and energy on these long shots. And if you do that, you're always diversifying and looking at new things, so you're not always super dependent on one. So that's one methodology that you the other methodology is by another very well-known growth hacker named is Andrew Chen, probably one of the best thinkers in this space. Um, and he's also a mentor at 500 Startups. It's the barbell methodology. So he, he uses this methodology as well too, where he took this methodology from like financial management services, personal, personal management. So for example, if you are you know, building your retirement egg, right? So you're saving money to go and, you know, for your retirement later on. So what you do is you spend like, 50% or 60% of your, of your money you put into bonds, right? Things that you know work for sure that you're never gonna lose money on. And then you spend the rest of your money on the other side of the barbell, which is these risky things, right? In this case, it could be, you know, from in financial service, could be stocks or it could be venture capital or angel investing. Or in this situation, it's on new emerging, you know, new emerging channels that could be very, very big. So this way you have some things that are working already that you know that work for sure, and you're experimenting with new ones. And this is the other methodology that you could use to think about growth. Does this make sense so far? Sort of makes sense? All right. And so the other great thing now that's just 
tons of analytical tools, right? There's all these off-the-shelf analytical tools like Kissmetrics, Moz, right? Google Analytics, Optimize, and just tons of these things that, I, I mean, we had to go build this ourselves back in 99, 2000. Even when I was at Yahoo in 2002, 2003, startups did not have access to tools. They needed valuable engineering time to build these custom products. All these things is, exist off the shelf now. So you should use them, right? Analytics are a key driver to learn what the hell is going on in your business. If you know any company going, if they don't have analytics set up, I think like I think they're doing something badly wrong. Even early stage companies, right? And the other thing that I leave you behind, which is is called Pareto's law, right? Everyone knows Pareto's law. Twenty percent of lawyers in Poland make eighty percent of the income, right? Twenty percent of startups, you know, or twenty percent of your customer base drive eighty percent of your revenue, right? And this is actually really powerful to to think about, and especially for early stage companies, is that twenty percent of your users are going to drive eighty percent of your usage. And I would even take that even further. Go and take a look at the twenty percent of the twenty percent, and that ends up driving probably fifty percent of your usage. If you can figure out what these big micro segments are, then you go you can go find more of them on these other channels. All right, so that's my tip for you. It sounds very, it sounds very simple. It is very simple. It's very hard to implement and very, very hard to do. But it is a big, big driver. If you look at most people's growth, this is a big driver of growth. Figure out the 20, 80, and then figure out the 20% of the 20%. And that's going to help you figure out what your fanatical, heavy user base and customer base is going to be. And then you go find more of these people. And the other thing that I think about too is that growth is really driven from leadership. It's really driven from community. We think about this a lot. Like this is actually all we think about at 500 Startups is growth and distribution, sales and marketing. Uh, you need to have a growth process thinking for, from the beginning. It's not something where it's like one team takes care of it. Everybody, your product, engineering team, your management team, everyone needs to be behind this and actually fully work on this. And the other thing too is that having balanced teams, all right? Something I see is a big challenge where, for me, it's a big warning sign is basically when you have people where they're all technical or they're all business, and that's actually a problem. We look for balanced teams, people we call hipsters, hackers, and hustlers, right? Hipsters, which are the design side, hackers, which is the technical side, and the, and the um, hustler, which is the business side. These balanced teams are really, really important. It's something we look for even in early stage companies. Um, and my view is that if, you do, if you're a technical person, make sure you find a good business co-founder and vice versa, and hopefully with some design talent. You know, right? And so anyways, last, last sort of um, you know, quote is from my, my boss, to be honest, design and marketing aren't just equally important as engineering. Designers, product managers, and technical analytical markers are usually way more important than coders, right? The main reason for, for the failure of most startups is because they cannot get customers. And so if you get, take anything from this, it's like, I don't care if you have a great product, but figure out the sales and marketing piece. That's actually the most critical piece right now. All right? And so I'm going to open up for questions. I'm, I'm, this is my presentation. OK, just before you ask the question, yeah. please raise your hand. I will pass you a microphone. All right. No questions? Uh, hi, uh, I have a question. Do you have any advice for someone who's uh, looking for uh, for customers, like uh, uh, in the in the business of Facebook? So, building something that uh, will have uh, people who will use the product and the other people who will be, uh, let's say, paying. So, for example, uh, I'm thinking about travel industry. Yeah. So you're giving for free product, uh, let's say, like uh, TripAdvisor. It's free for uh, for uh, for usage, yeah. and uh, uh, and uh, some people will need to pay for it. So, let's say, owners of the hostels or uh, hotels are the places. So, um, do you have any advice uh, how to approach, uh, let's say, those people who will uh, pay for the for those things? Yeah. yeah I mean, here, here's here's my take is that. Uh, and, and this is a, a very Silicon Valley sort of view where it's like, in situations like say it's advertising driven or it's like, you know, or um, what we call like freemium driven, right? You need a fairly big audience space to, to then monetize, right? My, my view is that, and, and like this is Silicon Valley VC thinking, where it's just like, we care a lot more that you actually get the reach. I'd rather you focus on getting the reach first because you actually have very little value proposition going to these owners where it's like, great, you have like 50 users. I don't give a crap. Unless there are 50 highly qualified users that will give you a lot of money. Right, and so I think you know. I guess I need to sort of understand a little bit more because I don't like to give general advice where it's like, oh, you should do this. I don't know enough about sort of what your 
what exactly the, the, the sort of specifics of your business. But what I would tell you, generally speaking, is that I think that it kind of, the answer is it, it depends. The way I would think about it is that if you're driving leads that are very like high, let's just say these guys would, these business owners would probably be willing to pay money for it if these leads like, you know, give them like, say it's like a thousand dollars or something like that, right? And they'd pay like, well, I give you a hundred dollars and every lead's gonna be like a thousand dollars or lifetime value, that's probably worthwhile. So I think it really depends on the value proposition you're taking to them versus if it's an advertising driven one and you have like a hundred users, they probably don't give a crap, right? So it, it will depend. Does that sort of answer your question? Sort of, yeah. Uh, and you're advertising driven or? So, uh, uh, let's say uh, people with money, yeah. you know, so travelers and uh, people who offer some service. Either it will be a restaurant, museum, or uh, uh, yeah, some amusement parks. So uh, I'll say like, uh, what will be the best approach? Is like uh, going to some uh, uh, some big organization who. Uh, combine all those restaurants or uh, people with uh, restaurant owners or going directly to uh, to restaurants and asking them for I, for I, some yeah I, I would say okay that, thank, thank you for, for explaining I would say in this situation I would probably go directly to restaurants first because it's actually part of the customer development process you're getting feedback versus trying to do this through like a third party because my view is that once you kind of have a general idea of just as you talk to hopefully several hundred restaurant owners and this I'm using this example right mm -hmm. then you have a general idea of what the product is looking like the way you scale then it's like okay so assume you have the right product and you have the sort of fit then the way you scale is like then go to a larger organization that has the reach of all these restaurants but in the beginning I actually think it's really important to go and actually talk to people yourself first. okay so uh, if I'm talking about uh, because yeah travel industry yeah. of course uh, hotels so uh, before going to let's say uh, booking.com yeah. Uh, that they can share 25 percent of their uh, of their money uh, it's better till I can afford it to go directly to hotels and uh, make deal with them then uh, then going first to booking.com and telling them okay I would like to make deal with you and uh, yeah, please I, I always think you know my, my bias is always better to go direct to the, to the paying customer instead of going through a third party so this is my view okay, cheers yeah. Hello, Mervin. Uh, my question is about uh, acceleration programs like yeah. I 500 startups. Uh, what are the key factors to uh, to run the successful uh, acceleration program? Because most accelerators in Europe, as far as I know, uh, aren't so good as, <laughs> as in the US. No, they're crap. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, and the, the, they're uh, crap. And uh, do you have any plans uh, going to Europe from? And running acceleration in Europe? Yeah, to be really honest, probably. No, so let me ask your first question. So, you know, what makes a good accelerator program? I think the mentor networks, I, I think, is really important. Um, also, the people running it, you hope that they've actually have some startup experience, right? I mean, the reality that's part of the reason I think most corporate accelerators just suck because n none of them ever have any startup experience, right? Like most of them. I'm not saying all of them. I'm generalizing, of course, right? Um, so I think the mentor network is really important. I also think the people running the actual program itself. Um, and then a lot of it is also just sort of what their focus is, right? Because I think like there are some that are focuses on B2B and there's sort of you know programs like Techstars, 500 Startups and YC that are very general. And so I just think it kind of depends. Like, and you know, are they very hands-on versus sort of hands-off? YC is a great program, but they tend to be fairly hands-off versus sort of Tech stars, which is very, very hands-on program. So I, I think it really depends on what you're looking for. Um, do we have plans for Europe? I would say probably not right now. We just opened up our San Francisco office beginning this year. So, you know, we are, we're doubling down the valley, maybe long-term. We, uh, as some people have asked before, probably not next year, but maybe the year after, but not clear, to be honest, I, I don't know. Yeah. But definitely lots of opportunities here, for sure. You've presented a lot of frameworks, a lot of uh, the Pareto rule, the old rules, yep. the new rules. Is it you, you've accumulated all this knowledge and you're presenting it, or is there a place that I can find most of them? Um, it's just stuff I've learned. You know, you read a lot, you work with a lot of companies, you work with a lot of smart, I'm very fortunate to work with a lot of smart startups and start sort of very, very smart business people and just pick these things up. <laughs> yeah, so I, I wouldn't know there's like one place for it. I'm just lucky to have a good network. Yeah. Too bad. Yeah. Um, I have a difficult question. Yeah, sure. 
um, there is a point in which you have to decide whether to continue doing what you are doing with your startup or quitting yeah. and uh, you know having another go at something else <laughs> and most people delay that point uh, you know as much as they can yeah. until it's so dead yeah. that it doesn't move right. what's your best advice yeah that's that's a that's a tough one because i think you know everyone tells you about sort of like that's perspective of like you know don't quit and do this other stuff and in my view it's just like you know there's this great saying I heard, it's like, you know, most startups fail not because they run out of money, it's but when the founders run out of energy. It's just like when you're getting up and you're just hating stuff and it's happening for a very, very long time, I think, I think that's actually where having sort of either good investors and having good advisors is actually really helpful. So people who sit on the outside who can say, what the hell is going on, right? And can really sort of push you to sort of make a decision on that. Um, and that's something, that's just tough. I, I would say sometimes that's sort of not always yeah, that's a, that's a tough that's a tough one. Right? And it's particularly so in Europe, uh, where failure is a real issue, uh, a real issue both in terms of uh, society and also in legal terms, in terms of uh, you know bankruptcy and bankruptcy laws. It's 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 really hard. I mean, it's, it's probably the good news at least in Europe. At least it's not Japan. They kill themselves in failure, right? So I mean, it's true. It's actually it's really true. You know, the some startup entrepreneurs are telling me just like so. A lot. If you look at a lot of entrepreneurs in Japan, not necessarily just like tech startup folks. It's really sad, but just like what they do is they, they actually take out insurance when they actually do their startup, and if they fail. They kill themselves so they actually can cover their family with the, like the insurance. That's like it's just that's fucked up, right? Like I don't get that at all. So I have. A I have a related question. I'm here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, what, 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 we, what would be your advice when the startup loses its momentum, but basically every, everything uh, seems to be working, but just losing the momentum? How do you, I don't know, grow up again? Well, I, I mean, that's actually where the, in, in my opinion, that's actually where the R metrics are actually very, very helpful. Um, because that's how, that's where you figure out like why you're losing momentum, right? Is it because you've exhausted sort of the audience space and you had to push into a new audience space, or is it mainly just you're attracting a lot of people and they're just not filtering through to the bottom and, and falling through the the conversion funnel? I, I think there's it's a it's probably much longer convers you know much longer discussion and conversation, but I think that the reality is that I think that's why these these frameworks are actually helpful to go and figure out where the problem potentially is. Does that make sense? Sort of. Do you have something specific? Yeah, I have specific, but that's even longer. Okay, I'll, I'll be here after, so. Any more questions from the audience? Flew all the way over here. No questions. Come on, guys. Ask about your startups. Ask for advice. How Don't be shy. <laughs> startup 500. Come on. Any further? All right. Well, people are shy, so that's okay. I'll, yeah. I'll be around. That's true. Okay. Uh, not in. The, um, let's see. We have a Ukrainian company. We have a. No. Pol oh yes, we do have a Polish company actually. It's device on the cloud actually in batch eleven. That is. That's, thank you for the reminder. Yeah, that is true. Nina, <laughs> that's a startup. So we do have one Polish company in in batch eleven right now. Um, you want the honest answer? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I think there's a lot of really smart, talented people. Um, I think the EU money has not been very well used here. Um, I think a lot of the investors are retards here. Um, <laughs> and I also think the reality is that, that a lot of startups don't know what they're doing. Well, that's actually true of every country, but I think the challenge is that there's a lot more focus for startups here on technical product over sales and marketing, but that's not just here in Poland, that's actually everywhere in Europe. That's actually a problem in my opinion. But generally speaking, the technical talent's amazing. Um, it's also people are very Western-minded. I think people also have good work ethic. And so it, there's, the, there's a lot of pieces here that actually make me very excited for the long term. In short, I'm less excited, to be honest. Um, partly because there's not a lot of downstream capital. That's a big challenge. Um, and l like I said, the EU money has been squandered here, in, in my opinion. And this, and this sort of grant thinking of, you know, it just does not, this grant thinking does not allow for like lean startup methodology, it does not allow a lot of things that actually would, should make startup sort of ecosystem thrive. 
but there's a lot of great talent here. And so that's actually a great starting point versus say, I don't know, Nepal. I shouldn't be, you know, I don't know why I said that. That's like I'm saying. Uh, so to answer your question. And Western-minded folks and part of the EU. So a lot of, a lot of good things. Thank you, gentlemen. And ladies.